Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Halo RSS webinar. Um, we're very excited to see you all this uh, today, and we hope that, uh, that you really enjoy our presentation. To get us started, I just want to say a little bit about scientific drilling. Here, here at Scientific Drilling, safety is one of our core values, uh, so much so that we've been able to make it an entire year without a recordable incident. And um, one of the ways that we demonstrate this value is our commitment to beginning in presentation with a, with a safety moment. And so today I just would like to challenge you to think about safety outside of the workplace. So it's easy for us to go through our, our daily lives whenever we're, whenever we're working and, and think about safety as it relates to our industry. But we really want to encourage everyone to be safe at home and, and to live safe as well. So uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to Josh Wilson. Um, <clears throat> Josh is our operations engineering manager. He oversees the engineering support, root cause analysis, data analytics, and performance optimization for Western Hemisphere operations. He also supports the R&D group in modeling development for analyzing downhole mechanics and dynamics and frequency data analysis. Um, Josh has an extensive background in drilling dynamics, <clears throat> excuse me, through operations support, field testing, data analysis, and fundamental research, and has published several papers on the subject. His experience base spans most North American basins and he's been an integral participant in the development and commercialization of the Halo rotary steerable uh, system. He continues to advise on downhole me mechanics for all major down uh, ma all major development projects in the company. Josh has a master's degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in petroleum engineering, both from Texas A&M University, and continues to collaborate and educate where he can. Josh. Uh, so thanks for the intro, Ben. I'm assuming most people are calling in from across the pond, so maybe I'll say good afternoon or good evening. Um, it's nice and early here in Houston. Stars are still shining, and I'm on my second cup of coffee, so let's get to it. Uh, so just a quick agenda of what I'll be talking about. Um, go over some key features of the tool, uh, provide a general overview of it and its capabilities, uh, and then most of the presentation is, is case studies kind of intermingled with with showcasing kind of the, the, the background engineering that actually leads us to uh, the performance outlined in those case studies. And then I'll close with um, our, our latest update from uh, performance summary after Q1 of this year. So key features, uh, Halo was intended to target the U.S. land market, and with that in mind, a uh, specific focus was given to high build rates up to 15 degree per hundred, as you see there, uh, high bit RPM, and maintaining continuous directional control in these long laterals that we, we drill. Um, and all of this while, while keeping the idea in mind of, of the potential of integration with drilling automation efforts. And so with that, everyone knows that's familiar with automation. It's, it's kind of a concept that continuously evolves in the industry, but we're certainly providing support and capability where possible. Um, and that's, that's been partly why we push for the integrated system. So we actually send the tool out to the rig as one unit that includes the steering portion of the tool as well as the NWD system. So all we have to do on location is plug into the tool, pick it up, run it in hole, and we're good to go. Um, and that that uh, automation has, has also been a, a big driver behind the development of our automated directional control, which includes our azimuth hold feature. And I think that's something that's that's been a big part of our success to this point. And it's, it's really impressed all of us um, how well it's been performing since the first time we put it in the ground. Um, and in speaking of, of the directional control, um, something that, that a lot of people find an interesting talking point is um, steering is achieved in the tool with, with 
three self-contained hydraulic systems or hydraulic uh, units. So it, it is the push a push the bit system, um, and that's driven by three steering pads, and each one of those is is a self-contained electrically driven hydraulic unit. Um, so we don't require any minimum pressure drop across the tool, or we don't require any additional pressure loss to activate that steering functionality. Um, and that can certainly be of help when we start talking about those those pressure limited applications that we come across. Um, and and something else worth mentioning is is we are one of the largest independent directional drilling service and tool providers. Um, and as such, we're not tied to any specific equipment to be run in conjunction with Halo. So that includes both bits and motors. Um, the majority of the work we do on US land um, is motor assist, rotary steerable application. So we typically always run it below a mud motor. Um, and we're not, we're not required to run it below our motor. So we've had, we've had plenty of success with third party motors as well as our motors. We certainly prefer to run our motors and that's mostly just to maintain control over the quality and reliability of that component. Um, but again, it's, it's really just a recommendation. It's not a requirement. Um, and coming back to the bits, we, we kind of follow a, a similar approach. I mean, we, we obviously don't have bits, but we certainly have an idea of, of different features on different bits and how they can either add or take away from the success of the job. Um, so we'll certainly have feedback on that and, and prefer to be involved in the selection process of bits prior to job starting. Um, getting into some of the finer details of it. Uh, we currently have two tool sizes, a six and a half inch tool and a five inch tool. Uh, the six and a half inch is intended for whole sizes seven and seven eighths inches to nine and seven eighths. Um, and the five inch is five and seven eighths to six and three quarter. I would say the majority of the wells we drill right now are seven and seven eighths or eight and a half inch. Uh, we've drilled plenty of successful eight and three quarter inch wells. Uh, we just, we don't seem to be getting the demand from clients on that whole size these days. Um, and, and speaking of, of adjustments for hole sizes, there's not a lot that changes between the hole sizes. Um, the only main difference are the steering pads. So those, those individual hydraulic units, we have to swap those out depending on the hole size. And then there is a, an upper stabilizer, which I'll point out on the next slide that the OD of that has to be adjusted, um, based on the hole size of drilling. So. Basically, relative to the hole size, the clearance between those components are the same. So you won't lose any directional performance in, say, going from a 7 and 7 eighths inch hole to a 9 and 7 eighths inch hole. Um, the only difference is the hole size. Um, in terms of sensor capability, um, I mentioned a little bit about automated directional control. Uh, the sensors that control that and feed into those algorithms are about 5.9 feet behind the bit. Um, we also have an annular pressure sensor that we're rolling out later this quarter, uh, and that will be right next to the steering pads. Um, so that should help out with ECD monitoring, which of course is critical in narrow pressure windows or can be of tremendous value for monitoring hole cleaning in real time. Uh, we also have real-time azimuthal gamma, um, and that's just over 15 feet behind the bit. And so in real-time, we can actually transmit to the surface uh, four bins, so quadrants, and we can log up to eight bins, I believe. Um, and our downlink system, so that's a pretty important one. Um, it is flow-based. So we modulate the pumps at the surface to communicate down to the tool or talk down. And the tool uses mud poles to communicate to the surface. And that actually, that, that works via, uh, uh, or provides a continuous two-way communication with the tool. So we don't, we don't ever have to stop what we're doing in order to communicate, change targets in the tool or, or whatever. We can just keep drilling, talk down and, and it receives and we keep on Keep on going. 
um, kind of coming back to the, the interface with automation. So the downlink system is not currently automated. It's, it's a manual uh, flow rate modulation of the surface, but we're certainly, certainly, certainly looking for ways and, and talking with um, top rig contractors on, on how to automate that process. So future thinking, uh, the, the end goal, um, I think would be, you know, if we had a, a specific button for each downlink command and we say, we want to send this command and then that talks to the rig and the rig automatically modulates the pumps accordingly to send that down. Um, we're not there yet, but it's certainly on the books um, to pursue going forward. So a little bit of the layout of the tool, as I mentioned, it is an integrated system. Um, so all that gets shipped to the rig as one unit, both the steering unit which is what we, we refer to as the lower part of the rotary steerable. So it houses everything that, that effectively controls the steering, hence the name. Um, so you obviously have the bit box at the bottom, um, the, what we call the slow rotating sleeve, which is that blue component right there. And on the slow rotating sleeve, that houses the three independent steering pads. Um, and we call it a slow rotating sleeve because as, as much as we like to idealize that that part of the tool does not actually rotate while we're drilling, in reality, it, it does actually rotate um, due to fluid coupling between the inside and the outside of it. But it's, it's rotating at a much, much slower speed than the bit. Um, so the bit, you're talking 300 RPM, 350 RPM, but that, that slow rotating sleeve is maybe one to two RPM per hour. Um, and that's something we can monitor as we're drilling and, and can verify that. Um, so just above that in, in, in the rotating part, so everything you're looking at rotates at bit speed apart from that blue component. Um, so just above the slow rotating sleeve are where our um, steering control sensors are, so near bit inclination, near bit azimuth, um, and those are continuous measurements and those again, feed directly into our steering algorithms. And above that, I mentioned we, we have an upper stabilizer on the steering unit. Um, and that component is always there. It's there for uh, directional purposes. And it's always, well, we can't say always. Typically, we run it at an eighth inch under gauge of whatever hole size we're drilling. Um, and then immediately above that, we have a little flex section, a short little flex section. And that, that small section of reduced OD, that is always in the tool. Um, and above that, we have the MWD collar, which screws directly into the top of that. And again, this is, it's an integrated system, so all this gets shipped out to the rig as one unit. The MWD part can either be a flex collar, which is what's shown here, or it can be what we call a stiff collar, in which you just have a constant OD across that, that whole piece. Um, a lot of clients, sometimes they just feel more comfortable with that stiff collar option. Um, it may help reduce vibrations a little bit, uh, but we, we really don't see any benefit uh, to running it when it comes to directional control. Um, I think our, our automated um, algorithms are robust enough that it's not needed for that purpose when it comes to um, inclination or azimuth control. Um, something else worth mentioning is, is we have built in high frequency vibration sensors in the tool. So, um, at multiple points across the tool and, and I like pointing that out because it's, it's something that's been invaluable since day one. I mean, it's, it's really helped quantify the severity of the dynamics taking place down hole, which inevitably has helped drive continuous improvement and constant ruggedization of the tool. Um, I think that's been a large part of our success. To this point, and I think it will continue to be a large part of our success going forward, um, because a lot of times we're we're blind to all that stuff, um, even after the fact, because we're not measuring the dynamics sufficiently down hole. Um, it's it's very hard to quantify dynamics at every point in at every point in the BHA just based off of one measurement point. So we actually added several measurement points, and it's it's really uh, brought to light a few things and helped us improve. So 
now I've, I've given you an introduction of the tool, um, how it's laid out, what it is. And now I, I want to get into actually more what it can do. Um, and not only that, as I mentioned, I, I want to show you not just that we can perform, but actually how we got to the point of performing, um, because I, I think that's a, a critical critical part to the journey, right? It's, it's not necessarily the end stop, it's how you got there. Um, so with that, uh, Halo and the Marcellus. So in the summer of 2018, we drilled our first 3D curve up there. Um, went in with a seven and seven eighths inch bit, picked up halfway through the back build, so about 50 degrees inclination, uh, then drilled the rest of that 3D curve out in the lateral. So we finished the well out, one run, curve and lateral. Um, yeah, the, the well was planned on a nine degree per hundred, so nominal dog leg or well planning dog leg, if you want to call it that. Um, but actually looking back at the data, we were achieving 12 degree per hundred. Um, and that was only at 75% of the maximum steering force output. Um, so we actually had more, more than what we needed. Um, we certainly weren't pushing on it because we were getting what we needed, but um, the, the capability was certainly there. Um, and we're, we're definitely proud of that performance not only because of what the tool achieved, but because it, it kind of verified our approach to developing the tool, which getting into that and, and talking about the development and, and the engineering that goes into it, um, there's actually a, a lot of that that goes on in the background, not just in the initial stages of the tool when we're initially designing it and coming up with prototypes and all that stuff, but it's, it's an ongoing thing um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of supporting engineering that that goes on in a pre-run and post-run basis. Um, so this this I'm hoping gives you a little bit of appreciation of that. So there's two plots here. Um, the bottom one is a comparison between measured and actual bending moments in the BHA, um, and that was actually from one of our first test runs with the tool um, and that that just went to show and prove that all the initial modeling that went in to help design the tool and create a, a robust mechanical design um, was a, a valid approach. Um, we had a lot more confidence in, in pushing the tool past its limits based on knowing that the modeling can predict to a reasonable degree what we're actually going to see in the hole. Um, so that gave us a lot of confidence in using that, that proprietary modeling to do that going forward. Um, the top plot is a comparison of estimated directional tendencies of the rotary steer wheel compared against uh, measured halo performance. So the dash lines are predicted build rates with the tool at different uh, bit steering values, if you want to call them that. It's, it's actually bit steerability, um, but basically it's, it's, it's a fudge factor for accounting for that bit formation interface and, and the tilt of the bit and everything. Um, and then the, the colored dots are actual measured halo performance. I and mean, they are colored according to ROP. Um, and something I, I think that plot highlights is bit selection becomes pretty um, important in the success of, of whatever application you're, you're talking about. So I think the, the ROP dependency on directional performance is a known um, dependency. And it's, it's fairly evident in the data you look at. Um, and actually, depending on the bit you're using, it can make that effect better or worse. Um, and, and going back to the bit discussion, we're, we're not in the business of, of selling people bits. That's not what we want to do. That's not what we're trying to do. So we're never going to come to you and say, hey, it's this bit or it's nothing. Um, but... It, it does highlight why we have a preference to be involved in that bit selection process. Um, we've, we've built up a decent experience base. We, we work with various bit vendors and we have a good feel for certain characteristics that 
can either help or hurt our performance depending on the application. Um, something that it's real important to keep in mind is is it's not just the rotary steerable that's in the hole, right? It's 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 the rotary steerable as part of a larger system. So there's the bit, there's the motor, there's whatever you're running in between. Um, all that works together to help you achieve your goal. It's it's never just one component. Um, so you just have to be mindful of that and 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 plan accordingly there. Um, so it's it's certainly you know we're we're proud of of the directional aspect of it. We're proud that the the tool mechanically holds together very well. Um, but something else that's maybe a more obvious focus is ROP or the speed at which we we get to the bottom of the well. Um, because without that part of it, it's it's harder to realize the cost savings associated with the tool. Um, so in, in Q3 last year, we were excited to achieve our first mile a day performance in the Northeast. Um, that was with an eight and a half inch bit. Um, and the feedback from the customer wasn't actually the speed in which we TD'd, it was the straightness of the wellbore we were drilling. Um, so they noticed that um, and told us that tripping out and casing runs after the well actually went a lot faster um, after drilling the well with halos compared to other uh, rotor steerable providers, which that certainly highlights the importance of wellbore quality. Um, and that's something that, that can definitely be a lot more challenging when it comes to drilling with mud motors. Um, so this, this run was actually part of a broader campaign that was, that was very successful in the Marcellus. Um, and that was actually with Chevron. And yes, Chevron gave us permission to discuss this data with, with external parties. Um, it was nine wells drilled off a pad, uh, just over 86,000 feet. Um, and again, the, the ROP itself is, is impressive. It's, it's up there with the best of them. Um, but I think the, the more important thing to point out, and I think the, the part I was most interested in hearing was, and again, this is, this is Chevron's words. Um, we had drilled the straightest well for them that they had had. Um, and so to see that with the performance drilling that we were achieving, I think is, uh, is quite impressive. Um, and that, that kind of straightness quantification, that's, that's their words and that's based on their own internal metrics, um, some things that they look at like unwanted curvature and, and a torch velocity index. Um, so again, it's overall impressive performance. We're not only hitting the performance benchmarks, but we're also keeping, keeping the well on target um, better than some others. Um, and maybe just to give you a, a little bit of reference of, of relative straightness between R wells and, and offset wells. So if you're colorblind, I apologize for the graph. It's green and blue, um, but it is what it is. Um, but maybe I can say uh, the straighter wells are ours and the crooked ones aren't. <laughs> uh, but the SDI wells are the blue ones and the Offset wells are the green ones, um, and you can you can visibly see um, how how much straighter ours are than the competition, and that's that's a direct result of our azimuth hold feature. Um, again, I, I mentioned that that the first time we put that thing in the ground with that feature in there, um, it really kind of amazed everybody of of how well it worked. Um, so we're we're pretty proud of that one. Um, I think the the best in class performance on this pad, we were at a maximum 21 or just over 21 feet wide left to right spread um, across the whole lateral section. And that's, so to give a point of reference, the, the customer defined window was plus minus 50 feet. Um, so you're talking 100 foot wide is your target window and we were within a quarter of that. Um, so again, overall performance with, with with still a, a high level of ROP. Um, and coming back to the, the underlying engineering that, that goes into achieving this type of performance. Um, so it's, it's just another benefit of kind of the approach we take to continuous improvement. 
Um, so these are these are some of the plots we look at post run on our halo jobs. So the right is what we refer to as a gun barrel plot. You know, there's there's a few different names out there for it, but it's what we call it. And basically, it shows you where the well path went with respect to the planned well path. Um, so that in of itself, I mean, you're you're talking here within a uh, 30 foot radius of where you're trying to be, which that by itself is is impressive. Um, but then it's even more impressive when you go to talk about, okay, well, how far were you off of where you were actually trying to be, um, not just the well plan, because a lot of the wells we drill with this involve geo steering. So we're, we're constantly changing targets um, based on what geology is telling us. And so if you look at the plots on the left, what you're seeing is target inclination and target azimuth versus actual measured values. So the yellow curves are the target values. So that's what we tell the tool we want to be at. And then the purple dots are what the tool is actually getting to and holding. Um, and you can only really see the yellow lines a little bit in the curve right here. And then you see this little dip in the azimuth, which I think is is more of an error in, in plotting than anything. Um, but I mean, for the most part, the, the purple dots are, are covering up the yellow. So it's, I mean, that's spot on of exactly where we want to be. Um, and again, it's only through that, that critical engineering review of, of your past performance is, is how you get to the point where, where you're able to achieve those successes. Um, so again, we're, we're definitely proud of our, not only our engineering team, but our operations team, every, everyone involved in the process there. Um, and just going back to the ROP aspect, so directional control is one thing that's certainly Certainly one of the benefits to running rotary steerable, but if we're not making whole, then as I mentioned, it's it's harder to realize those cost savings associated with it. Um, but just to point out, not only were we achieving um, really good directional control, but it was at substantially high ROPs. Um, you're talking average lateral ROPs ranging from 250 to 370 feet an hour. Um, so again, overall, really, really, good performance on on all fronts there um now i do want to say that the northeast is not the only place that we drill um we also have have quite a bit of presence in the permian um and last summer i think that's that's where this data set is from um we saw some really impressive reliability with seven consecutive runs with no issues, and that's that's almost 50,000 feet drilled. Um, and again, I, I think this this highlights how how focused efforts efforts can go a long way towards providing a reliable tool that performs consistently. Um, and a lot of that has to do with not just the initial design of the tool and the engineering that went into that aspect, but the the continual engineering support to every job that we run. Um, and part of that is managing vibrations. So we do look at critical speed analysis. Um, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with what that is, it's, it's basically estimating using a model um, how well, or it, it estimates certain operating parameters that have the potential to result in higher lateral vibrations. Um, and so what you're looking at there is actually the left side are some results of, of what a critical speed analysis is. Um, and, and that in of itself is, can be a little complex to break down and use. Um, even, even to engineers that have toyed around with it a little bit, um, it, it can get a little tricky and tedious at times. So what we try and do is, is not only the advanced engineering part, but we also try and transform it and make it presentable so that it's it can be used in a practical manner um, because if, if if we can't if we can't really use that information in a practical sense then there's not really a whole a whole lot of point to doing it in the first place. Um, so what you're seeing on the right is is our attempt at doing that um, instead of throwing a whole bunch of plots at the field personnel and say hey here's your roadmap we we actually try and map it out against uh, weight on bit. 
So on the right, you see two plots, which is critical speed and critical flow rate. Um, and basically, we plot the critical speeds out as red lines, and then we plot our operating points as those little dots you see. And the name of the game is just keep the dot away from the red lines. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, and I would say critical speeds, again, it's probably not new information to those of you that, that are used to doing critical speed analysis, but um, it's not an absolute. It, it doesn't guarantee removal of vibration. All it does is, is help minimize that risk a little bit more. Um, and we use it as a guideline. We don't use it as an absolute. Um, so just just want to throw that little statement out there um, because... That leads into this, which critical speed analysis only gets you so far along the road of managing vibrations. Um, it's also critically important to follow up with uh, an adequate review of the data. So here's, here's another look at, at some of the stuff that we go into on a post-run basis. Um, these are what we call, call performance heat maps. Um, and, and we can use these to kind of optimize performance or, or map out um, where we want to be on, on following runs and things like that. So what you're seeing is ROP mapped out on the left um, and lateral RMS vibrations on the right. And those are plotted against two of the primary inputs, so bit RPM on the y-axis and differential pressure on the x. So if we just look at ROP, um, nothing really stands out, nothing... Nothing that catches you off guard. It behaves as expected. Um, more differential, you're going to get more ROP. You're just taking a bigger bite out of the formation. Um, you're moving more, more rock per rotation of the bit, effectively. Um, but when you start mapping that out against vibration, you start to notice, okay, well, it's not just higher differential we want to be at, but we also want to be at a higher RPM um, because if we're at a lower RPM, maybe we have excessive vibrations that we don't necessarily want to be at for an extended period of time. Um, so it's really, when you start mapping out the data like that, you you really start to see the the full picture of what's going on down the hole. Um, you, can't, you can't just expect to lock in a parameter um, and hope for the best. Um, and, and I think these, these uh, performance heat mapping really helps out with that aspect. So as we keep as we keep going down this road of continuous improvement uh, with all the engineering support and the data review, um, we really start to see the the fruits of our labor. I think with longer and faster wells, the more we drill. Um, so about a month after our first mile a day in the northeast, we drilled our first mile a day well in the Marcellus, um, and that was actually quite a bit longer than the one in the Permian, uh, nearly thirteen thousand feet. Um, and getting into these longer and longer laterals, it's it's really only possible when you start to understand and optimize not only the time that you're on bottom drilling, but the time that you're not drilling. Um, and a large part of that is connections. Um, so this is actually a, a plot of of something that, again, we, we produce on a post-well basis for our halo jobs, um, and this looks at connection breakdown, so the time it took to, to make the connection. Um, and consistently, we're, we're sub-three-minute connection times. Um, and that's, that's not something that just happens overnight, right? It's, it's like everything else that I've showed you. It's, it's something that takes time. You, you learn premium your stakes and, and you strive to push forward to, to constantly improve. Um, and that's that's really why we put such an emphasis on data analysis and automated analytics like this, um, is to help reach those lessons learned quicker and to provide improvement before it ever becomes a real issue. Um, yeah, so a, a little bit more uh, performance, pushing the envelope on some things. So these are two back-to-back 12,000-plus-foot -back runs in the Permian. Um, I think this was back in February. And, and I liked showing this slide for two reasons. One, it shows that we can perform with or without our motor in the hole. Um, so the left side is a run with our motor and an Ulterra bit. 
The right side is a run with a third party motor and an NOV bit. Um, so the, the first thing that you might notice is the one with the SDI motor is maybe half the ROP of the one with the biker motor. Um, so that, that brings me to the next reason why I like showing this slide because it's, it offers an opportunity for a deeper explanation than just what you see there. So what, what is not on the slide is actually the road that led up to that run on the left. Um, so that run was in a formation called the Joe Mills, which if you're not familiar with that out in the Permian, it's a beast. Um, it, it really takes a lot of effort to get through and it'll burn up your bit um, in a hurry. Um, so the run immediately prior to that one was also in the Joe Mills and I think we had seven bit trips on that one. Um, no trips for Halo which is definitely a plus. Um, so our tool was, was certainly holding up to the beating that we were taking, um, but it was, it was throwing bits out left and right. Um, so it's a real, real improvement to see the run immediately following that after we review the data and we can hone in a little bit on, on what bits perform better and, and kind of what features we need to focus on for the bit going forward went in on the next well, one run and done. Albeit at a, at a slower ROP, but you still saved quite a bit of time um, even at that slower ROP. So to look at that at face value um, may be a little misleading, um, but the fact of that's where we ended up after a run with seven trips for bits um, is actually quite impressive when you look at it that way. Um, the run on the right was in the lower sprayberry, so a bit easier drilling than the Joe Mills. Not not the easiest drilling, uh, for sure, but, but definitely easier than the Joe Mills. Um, but again, solid performance from both our motors and third-party motors. Um, and then as, as, we, as we keep getting more runs and keep reviewing more data and we keep striving for that, that um, always making our stuff better. Um, we really started to challenge ourselves in more demanding environments and longer runs. Uh, so we just recently had a very successful nearly three mile lateral completed in one run out in the Permian. Um, and on the surface, that looks great. It looks like, oh, that was the easiest drilling out there. Um, so it, it must not have been a big challenge, but Again, when we get into the data, it's it's not that it wasn't a challenge. It's simply that we've gotten to a point where our tool can hold up to the environment that it needs to. Um, so this is actually the data from that run. Um, it's a heat map of, of the lateral vibration of the tool. And consistently, we're above 6Gs, um, which is definitely not where we want to be. Um, but to drill nearly 15,000 feet while you're beating your tool to death and have the thing hold together and no problem TV in the well. I mean, that, that's a real testament to, uh, to all the support that goes into keeping these tools running and, and keeping them improving as we move forward. Uh, so that's, that's all I had in terms of case studies. Um, what I would like to leave you with is is a recent update as of the end of Q1 of this year. Um, so last quarter alone, we drilled 240,000 or, or nearly 240,000 feet in five different formations. Um, and when you look at that compared to previous quarters and the footage we drilled there, I think that, again, highlights... Um, how far we've come and, and the improvement we've made. So if you compare it to Q4 of 2019, you're talking twice the footage drilled, um, which that is, is quite impressive. Um, and then Q3 2019, we drilled four times as much footage in Q1 of this year than we did in that quarter. Um, so again, I, I think that says a lot about our improvement and reliability as we march forward and kind of our focus on, on that continuous improvement cycle. Um, now during, during that nearly 240,000 feet, uh, we had a total on bottom downlink efficiency of 89%. 
um, which, you know, 89% is, is a pretty good number, I think. Uh, but something to maybe keep in mind when you read that is 89% doesn't mean that every time we didn't properly receive a downlink while we were on bottom drilling, it doesn't mean that we had to stop drilling to get the downlink. It just means that maybe we had to slow down a little bit for five or 10 minutes while we got the downlink and then pick ROP back up and keep going. Um, so I'd say that personally, I would say that 89% isn't, isn't a hard 89%, um, but you know, a, a missed downlink is a missed downlink. So that's, that's where that number comes from. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that we hope to improve going forward. Uh, the bottom charts give you kind of a breakdown of our top performing wells. So the left one shows you top 10 wells overall in terms of ROP. Um, and that's, that's over the history of the tool, not just last quarter. Um, so that, that gives you top performing wells in terms of ROP with hole size and formation. And then the right chart shows you the top four wells for each hole size uh, that we drilled. Um, again, in, in terms of ROP, um, and if you if you look at that data close enough, you can probably guess that most of our drilling occurs in the Permian of the Northeast. Um, but we've actually ventured out from those areas a little bit, uh, most notably in the scoop, scoop and the stack. Um, certainly not as many runs as we've had in the Permian in the Northeast, um, but we have had good success out there. So one of the first wells that we tested our azimuth hold on was was out in the out in the stack and that was that was something that was we were all kind of in awe of of how well it did on the first go around um i mean we were it looked like we had just taken a marker and drawn over the well plan um with the path that we drilled there so pretty impressive uh, and then we recently successfully drilled our, our first vertical curve lateral out there for a customer in the stack. So again, we're we're not confined to the Permian or the Northeast by any means. Um, that just happens to be where we've had the most runs to date. Um, yeah. So that that kind of encapsulates all I wanted to talk about. So maybe I'll I'll wrap up with a few a few last bullet points. Um, to date, we've drilled just over seven hundred thousand feet in commercial wells, um, certainly on our way to a million feet, which uh, we're definitely anxious to get there. Uh, something about a million just sounds good to everybody, I think. Um, and that's with ongoing deployments in West Texas and the Northeast, um, and certainly open to, to venture out from there. Uh, we also have a, a five inch halo available that is ready for deployments. Again, that's, uh, five and seven eighths through six and three quarter inch hole. Um, and everything electronically about that tool is the same as the uh, six and a half inch tool. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not like we're taking a brand new tool and, and throwing it out on the market. No, it's all we're doing is simply making some mechanical components smaller. So it fits in smaller hole sizes everything electronically and all the lessons learned are transferred directly to that tool. Um, so that's, that's available, ready to rock and roll. Um, and then I think through all this, or at least I hope that I've been able to highlight kind of what our tool is capable of and, and how we've been able to get to where we are. Um, and I think to this point, we've shown that we've, we've established ourselves as a real competitor to the rotary steerable market. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of that has to do with our key features like our, our real-time azimuthal gamma, um, automatic directional control, our, our integrated MWD with continuous two-way communication. Um, you know, all that cuts down on, on the time it takes to drill the well, um, which inevitably leads to cost savings. And certainly in a market like this, that's, that's what everybody's striving for these days. Um, so I think... I think with all that together, we'll, we'll continue to be a, a strong presence going forward. So with that, I'll say thanks. Uh, we definitely appreciate the time everybody took to call in. Um, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we also have, for technical support, um, our Senior Vice President of Engineering, Gerald Heisig, on the line that can 
help out with with some of the more technical questions if if and when they come up. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we have a, a lot of great questions in the chat. So before I start going through those, I just want to open that up. Does does anybody have that has questions in the chat or or anyone else for that matter? If you'd like to speak up and ask your question, please please go ahead and do so. Okay. Um, so first question, Josh, is it required that we run the scientific drilling MWD tool? Uh, yes, as of now, um, because it's an integrated system. So that entire thing gets shipped out to the rig um, pre-assembled. Um, so right now, yes. And I don't, I don't know, maybe Gerald can elaborate on that a little more. Um, but I know we have run an additional MWD above the halo, so you essentially have two MWDs in the string. Um, if if you so choose to have that type of verification in there, um, but right now, no, it's it's scientific only MWD because it's an integrated system. Okay. Uh, next question there, uh, you, you touched on it just a second ago with uh, the some of the success in Oklahoma, but have you drilled a curve and lateral with a single BHA? And if so, what flex cup sub configuration did you use to achieve this? Uh, I know we've drilled multiple curve laterals in one run. Um, and I want to say they were probably mostly with the flex MWD configuration. Um, there may have been one or two with a stiff collar option, but I not confident enough to say that uh, with certainty, but for sure with the flex option. Yeah, this is Gerald uh, with the flex collar. We did achieve uh, several curves. I think we did now about 15 or 20. Uh, we did uh, um, achieve uh, up to 14.3 degrees per hundred with the flex collar. We did soft land a few curves uh, starting so from 60 degrees with the stiff collars and achieved around about eight degrees with the stiff collars. Eight degrees per hundred. Okay, thank you, Gerald. Well, let's see, next question is, what is the length of the flex joint above the upper stabilizer? I'm assuming that's on the halo itself, but you might go ahead and mention the NWD collar, I guess. Yeah, so I think that is referring to this section up top. Um, that's a good question, and I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I want to say it's two to three feet long, round about there. I think that's a good answer. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, let's see. Uh, I think you just answered this. We said that um, if you're talking about a one-run BHA combination for curve and lateral drilling, we agree that the flex collar is the best way to go. Is that correct? Yes, okay. at this point. All right. How do you handle pad push when the holes become over gauge? Um, we haven't seen much of that issue arise, um, but... I think we can handle up to a quarter degree of overgauge. Um, past that, you will be limited just with the dimension of the tool. But that's that is the nature of drilling with the push the bit system. Okay. Uh, next, can you elaborate what is the high frequency recorder? What are the high frequency recorder ranges? Um, I can do my best to. Um, so we have three different high frequency measurement points in the tool, um, and those record triaxial vibration at a thousand hertz, um, as well as a, a an RPM measurement. Um, the RPM is a magnetometer base that's at 400 hertz, um, but that that seems to be sufficient enough to pick up quite a bit of um, information. Um, if that if that answers the question. Yes, sir. And let's see. Next question. Could you explain again what is the function of the slow rotating sleeve? 
So the slow rotating sleeve is, I guess, primarily intended to house the steering pads. Um, we opted to not have a steering mechanism that, that relied on constantly, I would call it a constant popping, I guess. Um, I know some rotary steerables, their entire system rotates at bit speed, um, and then you have actuating, actuating mechanisms that kind of pop out a pad every time it rotates around. So the slow rotating sleeve essentially keeps those pads in, in a relatively stable position so that we can automatically um, apply force in the appropriate direction. Um, I, think, I think that answers that question. Yes, sir. Next question. Uh, it's great that we recognize the bit and other parts of the BHA are part of the success. What is our input from the bit selection? Um, I wish it was a straightforward answer because <laughs> there, there are quite a bit of features on the bit um, that can affect different aspects of the performance. So that's anything from directional control to um, vibration management or even to um, hole cleaning around the bit. So there's there's quite a few things you need to look at and it's it's not like we have a list of these are our top three bits that we like to run. Um, we're, we're really open to what can be run. It's just we prefer to be part of that selection process because we do know that certain features can hinder performance in certain aspects and some features can help. Um, so that's that's really all it is, is, is we want to be part of that discussion and come up um, as a team with, with what the best solution is before we put it in the ground. All right, what is so magnificent on the Halo RSS azimuth hold capability when comparing to other RSS available on the market? Well, I mean, I, I can't say that I have uh, extensive experience comparing directly our competitors because um, that's just that we don't have that information. Um, all I can say at this point is that the performance has been well received by our clientele to this point. Thank you. What drilling fluid was used for the one one mile a day lateral? And obviously we have one of those in the Marcellus and another in the Permian. But uh, no off yeah, the top of our heads? I do not know off the top of my head, but I know that we run with both oil and water-based uh, muds. I, I think it's, it's a decent mix in the Permian, maybe more brine than oil-based. Um, yeah, I, I can't say what that one was off the top of my head, though. I uh, just actually just got a note from um, from someone else on the call. Mark Sharkey's on the call, and he said that was an oil-based mud. There you go. Appreciate it, Mark. Yeah, and the old, and it might be worthwhile to mention that the Northeast typically has fairly high mud weights, somewhere in the range of 13 to 13.5 uh, uh, pounds per gallon. Uh, in the Permian, it is typically lighter. You are looking at uh, eight to nines. From a, from a mud weight perspective, but it was all based mud, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what hole size were the Wolf Camp wells? Mm. I know I know you mentioned a couple of those. I saw seven and seven eighths on on your uh, Q1 uh, Q1 2020 slide, but yeah, I mean we for all of them. We've had seven seven eighths and eight and a half. Um, well, way back when, we may even had a, an eight and three quarter at one point. Um, but I mean, there's one seven, seven eights. Let's see. There's an eight and a half wolf camp. Um, so yeah, it's, we're not, we're not limited on, on hole size really per formation. Um, and we've drilled both seven, seven eights and eight and a half is, is all I can verify right now. Cause I don't have all of our data right in front of me. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see, can we simulate weight on bit sensitivity versus critical speed analysis? Absolutely, and that's what we actually provide. So that's that's how we map it out is because these things, uh, at least when you're talking about critical speeds uh, for lateral vibration, those will certainly 
weight on bit has a, a large effect on what those responses are. Um, and that's, that's how we provide that information pre-run as we map it out versus weight on bit. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, next question, I guess, uh, kind of goes back to the, the question before, well, which type of fluid should be used at high speed to cool a bit? Mm, I mean, it's up for debate, I think. Um, but if, if I had to wing, I guess, oil-based mud, but I don't think we've had a lot of issues in terms of heat checking on the bits. Um, so all I can say is that it, it hasn't been an issue to this point, really. Okay. Are you running any vibration mitigation tools with Halo? Uh, we have run a bit with uh, Tomex, uh, but we've also run a bit without Tomex. Um, and all I can say is that we see success both with and without it. Do you have any tests in six inch, six and eighth, and six and three quarter hole sizes? Sorry, what was the first part of that question? Uh, do you have any tests? Have we run any tests in six inch, six and eighth, and six and three quarter? Oh, I, I don't believe so, but but maybe Gerald has a comment on that. No, not as of yet. We are chasing a few test opportunities. But uh, thank you, Gerald. Other, other than extensive flow loop testing, not a lot. Okay, thank you. Uh, any plans on testing the tool in Argentina in the Vaca Muerta? Um, uh, again, maybe that's a question for Gerald. Uh, if eventually, this is obviously a potential target. Uh, that is a bigger question from a strategy or for the company, whether to be there or not. Uh, it is something that uh, it is uh, needs to be discussed further. We are not uh, excluding this, uh, but obviously uh, from a perspective uh, uh, from a business perspective it must make sense that there is enough uh, opportunities there to uh, to deploy that and obviously when you talk about rotary civil system in a more remote country then you talk about the, uh, the maintenance support and everything else i mean that is key to success is not only the tool and the design by itself but also the maintenance organization that is behind it that supports these and, and makes it successful and delivering uh, constant quality every time you you leave uh, the tool leaves the shop. So that is something that needs to be viewed in a bigger picture. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the dog leg severity limitation on the five inch halo? Uh, Thirteen degree per hundred, I think, is is what we believe we can achieve. Uh, next question is a lot bigger than than Halo RSS. It's talk about the impact of COVID nineteen in drilling industries. Um, I'm not sure we have enough time to cover that one today, but but I'll be glad to to reach out to you and 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 give you some give you some answers. Um, next, what are the tool's features that help it achieve its unique azimuthal accuracy? Uh, maybe Gerald wants to elaborate on that again, but uh, I mean a lot of that is is proprietary algorithms. But um, yeah, it's it's been a, a pretty good development project over the past few years. Um, but again, I, that's that's really a Gerald question, I think. Uh, so we're talking about the Asimus uh, measurement capability. Sorry. Yes, sir. Little, yeah. No, I mean, uh, that's one of the benefits of having uh, high frequency data recording capability in the tool that you can look at your signals, you can look at your influence of the various reading parameters on those signals. And uh, with that, you get an idea how to compensate and everything else uh, for certain effects. Uh, that is all I can say. There's obviously a very fairly noisy environment and getting some, deriving some quality and uh, and stable asimus measurement in such an environment uh, requires some experience and uh, very excessive uh, signal processing okay thank you um i know josh you touched on the slow rotating sleeve and i think you've answered this question i mean the slow rotating sleeve is is by design 
Uh, it's not necessarily a compromise. Uh, do does the software correct for the rotation of the sleeve? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It does. Uh, basically, the software checks more or less uh, every other second uh, for its rotation position and adjusts the parameters on the on the pads. Okay. And let's see. Does formation's mechanical strength affect the push the bit technology? What is the cutoff compression compressive strength to help keep good azimuthal control? I think that's a that's a fairly loaded question. Um, it, formation strength itself does not impact the functionality of that system in the tool. It it affects how the bit cuts the formation, um, which that feeds back into appropriate bit selection. Um, it's critical that you have the right bit for the right application. Um, as well as it, it may come down to you want to spin the bit faster or slower, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so it's it's not necessarily that it inhibits the system, um, but absolutely it'll it'll affect how that bit is interacting with the formation, which inevitably affects how the hole gets made, um, whether that's going straight forward with ROP or it's cutting to the side and building angle. Uh, let's see, and let's see, um, would we see an improvement in average ROP if we fully automate the downlink process? Um, I mean, potentially, but we, we actually just looked into this on in terms of, of downlinking and, and what it did to our ROP. So we can downlink while we're on bottom. Um, and it, it doesn't hold anything up. So after a connection, we, we get back to drilling, and if we need to downlink, we modulate the pumps at surface. Tool accepts whatever we're trying to tell it and continues to drill. Um, I mentioned the, the downlink efficiency. So in the event that we have a missed downlink and the tool doesn't properly receive that signal, we might have to slow ROP down for five or 10 minutes while that's getting repaired, but or while while the tool is receiving that message. Um, but looking at the overall effect on ROP, it's it's a pretty small percentage. You're talking less than one percent of the total ROP. What what automating that process will do is free up the people resources on the surface um, to not have to mess with it. Um, and certainly I, I think just the psychology of that, the, the less you can distract somebody, the better they're going to do and what they're trying to do. And that's that's kind of the motivation behind that. Great. Uh, let's see, does the HALO have a sensor to measure uh, high frequency torsional oscillations? Uh, yes. So we picked that up a lot in pretty much all of our vibration sensors. Is the MWD tool uh, associated recoverable? Say that again. Is the MWD tool retrievable? Um, I, I think not. No. no, it is not. And let's see. Have let's you not ever... forget, we, we always run the tool below a motor. So you obviously, as a first, yeah. first choice, you have a motor in the way to get to it. Yep. yep. Uh, let's see, have you ever run into non-rotating sleeve slippage beyond what is required to be able to steer effectively? Uh, we have, but I can't remember when. Um, when it did happen, it, it, I mean, it was a very isolated type thing. It's, it's not a common occurrence, I can say that for sure. No, to really in, in, in the US. Go ahead, Gerald. In, in the US, in the land market, you don't see it because you typically engage. You don't really drill these overgaged uh, holes that you you wash the uh, the hole away and have an overgaged hole. So uh, the only time that we have really seen it was uh, due to a, uh, a let me say a design issue that prevented the uh, the pads to come out. Normally, the pads are in contact with the formation and will prevent uh, prevent rotation. Thanks, Drew. Uh, uh, what are the biggest challenges and what are the most common failures seen when the Halo tool experiences them? Mm, biggest challenges. I mean, when it comes to, as I mentioned, um, it's about system performance, right? So 
it's not just let's slap any old bit on it. Let's slap, you know, any old equipment in the BHA. It's, it's something you have to look at a system view and, and make sure all your different components are working in, in sync with one another. Um, so, I mean, challenges, vibration is, is certainly one of them. We're, we're not um, impervious to that as, as any rotary steerable um, operator, I think, can contest to. Um, but it, it goes back to the continuous improvement approach that we take where we're, we're constantly critically reviewing the data um, and trying to make things better before they become big issues. Um, I think, was that, was that the whole question or maybe I forgot part of it? Uh, biggest challenges and, and most common failures. Oh, okay. Maybe well, again, Gerald that, can elaborate on on the failure. Yeah, mode. that's that's obviously a dynamic uh, dynamic target. As you uh, as you work through the continuous improvement process, you learn from your failures. You have certain failure modes that uh, that you address and prevent those from happening again. And um, a lot of that has to, had to do obviously to. Uh, uh, with the high frequency torsional oscillations and uh, prevent things from moving that are not supposed to move. That's all I can say. Yep. Thank um, you. Um, Salman, we're, we're not understanding your question on laser drilling operations. Um, I'll, I'll try to reach out to you directly after the call and, and see if we can get you an answer, okay? Uh, let's see, Samir would like to know what was speed by Halo RSS in shell-based formation or clay-based formation? Uh, most of our runs have been in shell, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Shale or sand, yeah. yeah. Okay. How long does it take to downlink to the tool? Uh, usually about five minutes or so, I think, six minutes. It depends on the type of downlinks. We have some fairly short pre-programmed downlinks where, uh, for example, to communicate with the tool to notch up the target inclination by 2.25 uh, degrees, there's a, that's a, that's a two and a half minute downlink. If you want to downlink a new complete, uh, complete target azimuth or a target inclination, then it will take a little bit longer. Gerald, so when, it, we're on, when we're drilling on, on bottom, does it really matter how long the downlink takes? Is that really a factor? Uh, not necessarily on the overall RP, but obviously uh, you would like to have that uh, as fast uh, received as possible. I mean, again, the faster you can transmit it, uh, the faster you can execute it. Um, but you can also obviously plan this ahead in your execution when to send a downlink. So when you know it's going to take five minutes for the downlink, then you will send your downlink one or two feet earlier than you would when you get a immediate response. Okay. Um, next question here. Let's see, to what extent did you observe motor degradation, decreasing observed bit RPM compared to calculated when drilling curve or uh, curve and lateral, or dedicated laterals in the Permian? Uh, I mean, we, we haven't seen a lot of excessive motor degradation. There certainly, um, as you drill longer and longer on a motor, sure, you lose you lose some of the output just due to wear on the stator. Um, but it, it hasn't been tremendously severe or anything. Um, occasionally, we, we have seen some, some odd behavior um, with a, a faulty motor that was in the hole, but Again, that's that's not a that's not an overly common occurrence. Okay. And let's see. How is uh, how is tripping with the halo? Are you generally having to back ream or or ream back into the hole? Not normally. No. If if anything, it's we have to ream if we. Well, we have to ream against our wishes if we go in after a motor run. Um, so a few of our clients have have drilled curves with motors. Um, and as everyone knows, that, that motor drilling a curve can be a, a tortuous process. Um, and so you, you want to be sure that you've, you've got all your ledges out um, before you, you try and trip in with the halo. Um, so we prefer not to ream. Um, and I would say for the most part, we don't, we don't normally have to ream when we come out of the hole after drilling with it. 
It really depends on the on the area where you are in, whether you have to deal with losses and you might have uh, things building up there in sections where you have losses. It it depends. We have uh, uh, the fact that the tool is actually a six and a half inch tool helps for sure. Uh, to get to get smoothly out of the hole, there might be other things that are, uh, are hanging up on the motor side. But uh, we have been drilling uh, a halo with seven inch motors in seven, seven, eight borehole size, and uh, we're coming out of the hole very smoothly. Okay, perfect. I think you touched that there. Halo halo has been taking the reaming. OK, correct. We're just paying attention to the parameters. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that kind of rounds out any of the questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask or, or any other comments they'd like to make? All right, we definitely have gone a little bit over our allotted time, but we had uh, some great questions. Thank you guys for the participation so much. We, we really enjoy your, your feedback. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be having a, another webinar with Ken Webb our MWD product line manager, and he's going to talk about what we do to to ensure our MWD reliability and how we've increased MWD reliability over the years. We'd love to have you join us again. Please let us know if we can do anything for you. Josh's contact information is there on the screen. You can always get in touch with us via the website at scientificdrilling.com. And thanks everyone for your participation.